Well, thanks again for having me. I'm presenting on Gadigal country today. Um, and I, I really am excited to share the Frog ID project with you and council today, because it's a really exciting initiative that's really making giant leaps in frog conservation. So Frog ID is a national uh, citizen science project. It was started in 2017 by the Australian Museum. Uh, and today I will share what the Frog ID project is all about, uh, what we found with Frog ID recordings, and um, how you can get involved in Frog ID Week, which is starting on Friday, uh, which is our annual frog count. So whether you're new to frogs or new to Frog ID, or whether you already contribute to Frog ID, hopefully you will learn some new things about the project today and appreciate our frogs a lot more. At the museum, I am actually part of a really big team. I am the project coordinator of the Frog ID initiative, but I work alongside lots of these people in the herpetology department. So um, these people work on amphibians and, and reptiles across Australia. Uh, and we're led by uh, our lead scientist, Dr. Jodie Rowley, um, but also many people on this screen listen to Frog ID recordings that come through the Frog ID app. So they listen to every recording and help identify the frogs that you have recorded. Um, so I really would like to acknowledge that some of these slides are um, made by some of my colleagues. So uh, I really am thankful for their help in delivering this presentation too. But a little bit about me. So as uh, mentioned, I have a background in zoology. I started working in citizen science in tropical Australia. So I studied zoology, which is a branch of biology that studies the animal kingdom. And eventually my studies led me to an opportunity in um, James Cook University, working for a rainforest biologist and looking for wildlife on mountaintops to understand how biodiversity is being impacted by climate change. And um, this was my first citizen science experience. So I had the privilege of working with people from all across, across the globe um, who would come and help us uh, find animals um, in the rainforest uh, and help us collect data on scales normally not feasible. So collecting across space and time um, with you know many hands make light work so it was really a great insight to the value of citizen science in that way collecting data on scales that wouldn't be possible usually but it also showed me other benefits of citizen science so getting out in nature really made us feel good and um, energized and and also it just really showed me that citizen science is for everyone so even people without a scientific background or didn't know anything about science, they could really have a valuable impact on scientific research by taking part. So hopefully today you will see um, whether you're a student, mum, dad, or uh, anyone, you can be a citizen scientist as well and, and help save our threatened wildlife. Um, and at the museum, we have a number of citizen science initiatives, Frog ID is our flagship project, but we also have Digivol, which is an online digitization volunteer program. So this is where you can help transcribe data from natural history collections. And there are a number of online expeditions you can embark on uh, with themes that focus on things like insects or, or mollusks, um, and even collections from the diaries of renowned zoologists from the 19th century. So this is really uh, incredibly important to help make uh, citizen science data available to everyone across the globe. And we've also got the Aust Australasian Fishes Project, uh, which is looking at the shapes and sizes of fish. So if you're are out in the marine environment and want to take part in that project, um, do get involved in that too. But today I'm talking about Frog ID, which is our flagship project. And we started Frog ID for a number of reasons, um, mainly because we've got these incredible pieces of technology in our back pocket, these smartphones. Um, but uh, also another big reason is that globally frogs are in a lot of trouble. Uh, a big reason 
um, that our scientists wanted to start this project is because they have become aware of our frogs really threatened with extinction. <clears throat> So when people think of endangered animals, they might think of big charismatic megafauna like rhinos or pandas or um, other large iconic mammals. But hopefully after today, more of us will consider frogs because sadly uh, they're declining really, really rapidly and more rapidly than some other animal groups. Um, so across the globe, 42% of all amphibian species are threatened with extinction, and they face a number of threats, unfortunately. One of the biggest threats is disease. So there is this amphibian chytrid fungus, which is affecting frogs all over the globe. Unfortunately, at least four of Australia's species have become extinct due to this disease. So that's a main threat to our amphibians. Uh, also facing biodiversity and frogs is habitat loss and degradation. So we're really altering our um, the frogs environment and unfortunately that's having an impact on their populations. Also pollution. So frogs are really tied to um, aquatic um, environments and really tie into um, land but also uh, um, water. So they they really absorb everything around them because they're so tied to water and um, are really sensitive to change um, in the waterways, such as pollution. Introduced species are also impacting our frogs. So for example, the introduced cane toad is competing with uh, the resources that our native species need. And also um, introduced species like uh, pigs and horses are really disrupting sensitive environments that frogs live in. For example, our alpine environments um, that the southern corroboree frog lives in, for example. Uh, maybe not so much here, but um, across the globe, wildlife trade is a big threat to our frogs. They're being uh, captured illegally and, and transported, and this is really um, causing major decline in some of our species. And also climate change is having an exacerbating impact on all these existing stresses. So drought and increased fire and increased extreme events like floods um, impacting frogs and other wildlife as well. And we really want frogs to be around. So um, one reason why we wanted to start this project is there are so many reasons why we want frogs to be kept around. One is that they're really important bioindicators. So I mentioned that they're very tied to uh, water and environmental change. So when frogs um, are disappearing from our ec ecosystems, it's a really big sign that something is wrong. They're also a very important part of food web. So we were talking earlier how lizards eat frogs and they do form an important part of um, other animals' diets. So lots of birds, lizards, and reptiles eat frogs. Um, so, and also tadpoles. So they're very, very important food source and nutritious snack <laughs> for other animals in the food web. Tadpoles are also really important in helping regulate algal blooms. So there are studies across uh, the globe that show when frogs disappear and when tadpoles disappear from our streams, you get really bad ecological impact. So um, you get algal blooms, you get really, really unhealthy waterways when tadpoles are not around to help regulate. And maybe more of a selfish reason, but we want frogs around because they really help with advancing medical research. So for example, this um, brightly colored frog down the bottom, the crucifix frog, um, some scientists are looking at the substance they secrete on their skin because it's really sticky when it's wet as well as when it's dry. And so they're using this substance to understand what they can use in knee surgery um, in medical research. So no frogs are harmed in this study, but they're really looking at the, the kind of um, uh, chemicals that are on frog skin. There are also antibacterial and antifungal properties in frog secretions uh, that are really, really interesting for uh, medical scientists. And another reason is that many of our frogs, so we have 246 species of native frog in Australia, 
Many of them occur here and nowhere else in the world. So they're really unique to our country and we really don't want them to disappear or any more species to disappear. So uh, one reason we created Frog ID as well is that there's just so much we don't know about frogs. So this is a map of Frog ID records across Australia. And in any one area in Australia, there might be about 10 to 40 different species of frogs that you might be able to find in a short distance. Um, where I am in, in um, the eastern suburbs, for example, there's potentially um, up around 30 that, that can be found around, around me um, and probably similar numbers where you are. Um, but when you zoom in a bit closer, there are actually lots of areas where we don't have scientific records of frogs at all. And we really want to understand where frogs are and where they're breeding to help inform their conservation. So because we have all these data gaps, it's a real barrier to frog conservation. So that's one of the main reasons why we created Frog ID as well, to help fill these knowledge gaps. And there are so many knowledge gaps when it comes to our frogs. New frogs are being discovered every single year. Um, there's just so much we don't know about them. For example, a few species were found in recent years. Uh, in 2016 alone, there were about four different species that were described to science. And this is one of them. It's the Cape York graceful tree frog. And it's very special to us because our lead scientist, Dr. Jody Rowley, helped co-describe it and, and found it in North Queensland. And it also features on our logo occasionally, but it's a, such a beautiful frog. And it's just so crazy that we're still discovering new species that are so uh, beautiful like, like this. We're still um, yet to understand so much about our amphibians. This is another species that was discovered or described to science recently, the Southern Heath frog. So it was previously thought to be um, one species, the northern heath frog, but it has recently been split into two species thanks to research by um, our team, but also the South Australian Museum. So just a couple of examples of how we're still learning so much about our frog species. And another reason why we created the Frog ID project was that every frog species makes a unique sound. So they're essentially yelling what they are. And this is really great for scientists because it's an accurate way to identify frog species. And that croak or bark or whistle that you hear calling from your pond or backyard or um, bushland, that is actually a male frog calling for a female frog. So it's actually a, a male frog looking for a mate. Um, it's like a love song. <laughs> Uh, the next few slides, I will share a few examples of the different frog species we have in Australia, just to show you how unique and different they can sound. They don't just croak, they make amazing sounds. So this is one example, the striped rocket frog. There we go. <laughs> Sounds like a duck. <laughs> Next, we have one of my favorite, which is the Northern Spadefoot, one of our burrowing frog species from Northern Australia. Oops, I'll go back, hold on a second. <laughs> Sounds like an owl. <laughs> Uh, next, we have the graceful tree frog, which again sounds very different. So very, very different sounding frogs all across Australia, and they're just a few examples. But really, these different sounds that frogs make is really, really uh, accurate for identifying similar looking species. Um, and this is one example of that. These are two green stream frog species, but um, one is the Barrington top tree frog and another is the green stream frog, which you can find uh, in Camden Council. And they look really similar. In fact, frog biologists find it very, very tricky to identify them, even when they have them holding um, in their hand. 
And so calls are really important to identify the differences in these two species. This is what they sound like. That's the Barrington top street frog, and this is the green string frog. Much more squeaky. So male frogs call to attract female frogs, and um, sometimes the call is the best way to tell them apart. And moreover, with calls, we can ID the frog very accurately, but we also don't need to disturb them. We don't need to see them. Um, and we can learn so much about uh, their breeding season and breeding habitats, which is much more valuable information than images alone. So in summary, we created Frog ID because our frogs are in a lot of trouble. And in Australia, we've already lost four species and many others are threatened with extinction. We don't know that much about our frogs, and this is a big hindrance to their conservation. And uh, we created Frog ID because male frogs call and essentially are yelling out what species they are. And we also created this app because we need people power. We need everybody's help to fill these knowledge gaps and help save our frogs. So I will now talk about what the Frog ID app is and how you can use it. Um, for those of you who are already familiar with this, um, I apologize, but for the newcomers, uh, our Frog ID app is a free field guide for your smartphone that is um, of all the frogs in Australia. So any uh, scientific research that comes out, our team updates the app uh, very quickly. So it's the most up-to-date field guide you can get on Australia's frogs and it's free. But um, mostly it's a tool to record frog calls. So not only can you use the app to understand what frogs are uh, around you, um, where they're located and what they sound like, but it's um, a good tool to monitor the frogs in your area and contribute to our national understanding of frogs. So to use the Frog ID app, when you hear a frog or think you hear a frog, even if it's a loud chorus of multiple frogs, we want you to pull out the Frog ID app and press that big rec record button on the front screen. All you need to do is record the frog for at least 20 seconds or up to a minute. And it doesn't matter if the frog isn't calling throughout that whole time. As long as its advertisement call is within that 20 seconds, that's all our team needs to listen to the frog call and help identify what species it is. Now you don't have to um, go through th these filter steps if you don't want to, but these help shortlist what frog species may potentially be around you. You can also skip that step. Uh, the next step is to select which frog species you think you hear. If this is too hard, you can skip it, but it's quite a fun way to test your identification skills and listen to your recording and select what frogs you think you have recorded. Whether it's the bonk of the banjo frog, the clicking of a common eastern froglet, or maybe the maniacal cackle call of the um, tree frog here. So you can select which species it is and press that submit button when you're ready, uh, but you can also add notes and you can add photos as well if you like. It's a good idea to check your profile regularly on the Frog ID app and make sure it's all looking um, as it should. Uh, this is also where you will receive updates and we'll also email you. And you can also log into your Frog ID profile, which has had a recent revamp in recent uh, months. Um, logging into your web profile on the Frog ID website, you can see all your Frog ID recordings on a map and you can uh, get a tally of all your submissions. So for example, I've recorded 28 different species, which is, I didn't think I had recorded that many, but amazingly, since I started using Frog ID two years ago, I have recorded a lot across Australia. Um, this is also where you can export your Frog ID data in a CSV spreadsheet, if you like, uh, and you can also make your profile um, 
you can share your profile if you have made it public. So this is what I've circled here, um, where you can share your profile and this is where you can export your recordings for your own personal use. You can also look at all the badges we've released on the Frog ID project. Uh, and the more you record with Frog ID, the more badges you can earn. So I have about seven of the 10 badges that we've released and I'm really keen to get this Australia wide badge over the next year. So this is what it looks like on the other end um, to our Frog ID validators. So this is uh, Dr. Jodie Rowley, for example, and she's listening to the recordings that have been submitted to the Frog ID project. And what she can see is this information. She's looking for um, really accurate date and time data and geolocation data and also GPS accuracy that is automatically applied when you make a recording with the Frog ID app. This is why it's really important to use the Frog ID app itself because it automatically uh, obtains this information from your smartphone technology. And so this is what our team will look at and they'll listen to your recording and um, then they'll email you what you've recorded. So the exciting thing about Frog ID is that it's one of these citizen science projects that's really having an incredible impact on research and conservation. In just short, I guess we're almost at five years now, um, we've really gone gangbusters and I'm excited to share some of those scientific outputs with you today. Uh, so this is the most recent um, graph of number of scientific frog records we've gathered thanks to thousands of people using the Frog ID app. So you can see that big spike here. Um, that was Frog ID week of November last year. It was our biggest month yet. Um, and we've just recently had our second biggest month in um, October. So I think we're up for another big November this year, gathering it's a, another La Nina wet summer. We might um, have a really big Frog ID week, which is great. Um, these are all the frog records we've gathered across Australia and you can see these figures are just just really hard to <laughs> fathom really. Um, in five years we've gathered over 480,000 recordings and that has resulted in over 750,000 frog records. Now when we first started Frog ID in 2017 our CEO had this massive target and wanted to get a million frog records, you know, and we just thought that's nuts. That's never going to be achievable. But with um, the help of our team at the museum, we've really um, had some great marketing behind our project and, and just had um, lots of people just to get really excited to record frog calls. And, and it's just been really amazing to get um, that many frog records across the state of Australia. And so this has resulted in about 211 species on our database, which is about 85% of the known frog species in Australia at the moment. Now we're still discovering new species, of course. Um, so these are our top 20 species. This, this frog pictured here is a common Eastern froglet, and we have uh, over 30,000 records of this species. And I just wanted to put this in because it's really important to record the common species as well as those that are more rare because those common species will be around a lot and help us capture a lot of data and understand trends and any patterns over time. So it's really important to record as often as you can with Frog ID and even record these really common species around you. So what's Frog ID telling us? Um, well, one of the first studies we produced with the Frog ID data set in its first year was actually on our iconic green tree frogs. Now, this species is actually really um, of high interest in Camden Council. We're really concerned about them and we want to know how they're doing. What Frog ID data has shown us is that our green tree frogs are actually disappearing from Sydney. There was a lot of anecdotal evidence um, of this, anecdotal reports of this before Frog ID started, but it wasn't until thousands of people out there were using the Frog ID app 
that we actually had the first evidence to show that yes, there were very few records of green tree frogs around Sydney. So the next step is for us to get an understanding of um, why this is. So um, the more frog ID recordings we gather around Sydney, the better, especially around this species, to help us understand if they're recovering and, and which areas we can really target to help um, increase their numbers. Frog ID is also increasing our understanding of threatened species records. So for example, the Sloan's froglet, which is found on the border of uh, New South Wales and Victoria, this is an endangered frog and people are out using the Frog ID app um, as part of a group called the Sloan's Champions. And they're out there regularly looking for this winter breeding frog species. So they're not calling at the moment, but in winter, people are out there in the freezing cold listening for this frog. And they have just revolutionized this species um, conservation efforts because they've gathered over 2000 records of this species and actually um, uh, increased our understanding of where they're distri distributed. So we know that they're actually across the border in Victoria a lot more than, um, than what we previously Thought. So this is really good news to help uh, protect the species. Another example is the Karanda tree frog in North Queensland, this beautiful uh, frog down the bottom here. Um, and we have over 160 records of this species thanks to people using the Frog ID app um, and looking for this rainforest species. But it's not just threatened species and common species. Also introduced species um, are being monitored through the Frog ID project. And this is uh, a cane toad. And every month our team sends the um, WA and New South Wales government cane toad records to help uh, inform their management strategies for this introduced species. So the cane toad is really bad news for other animals in our ecosystem animals that eat them uh, um, really get sick and, and some can die. So we really are concerned about them um, expanding their, their reach across Australia. So Frog ID is actually showing where cane toads are breeding through recording their, their calls. And um, we're really getting a better understanding of where they're establishing through their calls. Uh, but not just introduced species, also native species, which are getting transported to areas where they're not normally distributed. So, for example, the eastern dwarf tree frog is um, normally found on the eastern um, coast. Uh, and it has been um, establishing in parts of Melbourne and also in Canberra, where it's not normally found. So this is really concerning because it's potentially spreading uh, disease, but also uh, competing with the native frog species in that area. So we're really monitoring our hitchhiking native frog species as well as our introduced species. A few other examples of how frog ID is informing conservation um, is research by uh, one of our PhD students, Gracie Liu, and this is from her. Um, publication. It's an, a beautiful abstract showing that uh, the species that are most uh, tolerant and also intolerant of human modified spaces. So we're constantly changing our landscapes, um, you know, building uh, mines and farms and, and, and buildings and, and really that's having an impact on our frogs. And this study showed which species are actually thriving, like the striped marsh frog, and which species are not like the crawling toadlet. So she found that most of our generalist species, so species that don't mind what time of year they breed or where they breed, um, and species that really like human structure, like the white-lipped tree frog, are doing pretty good. Um, and species that uh, lay their eggs on, on the ground and in, um, they really rely on these moist environments and have really restricted ranges are doing pretty, um, they're really vulnerable. So um, species like the stri striped marsh frog really do like human environments. So um, we'll often hear them in our, in our, around our homes in Sydney. 
Frog ID is also informing bushfire recovery. So we were actually one of the first studies to uh, release a paper on how frogs are persisting um, after bushfire. So the black summer fires of 2019 and 2020, uh, our scientists were really concerned they couldn't get out there because of COVID lockdown and, and bushfire kind of um, safety reasons. Uh, but thankfully, thousands of people were out there recording frog ID recordings um, on their properties uh, and really showing that this was a rare good news story. There were frogs calling after fire um, and they still are now. So keep your eyes peeled for another bushfire study from the frog ID team. But it's one of those rare um, good news stories. And thanks to people power using the frog ID app, collecting this data in the fire zone. So we've got a really good data set for things that happen to our biodiversity um, that we don't hesitate happening. For example, drought, fire and floods. More recently, our team also uh, produced the Australian Frog Atlas. So on the Frog ID app, you'll see these distribution maps, which have now been updated thanks to Frog ID recordings. So this is the uh, red tree frog. And you can see here in the top uh, right map, the um, global amphibian atlas is actually more, um, it's not as accurate as the Australian Frog Atlas below it that we produced um, in recent months. So we're really getting a better understanding of where frogs are distributed across Australia. And we have made these maps uh, publicly available for anyone that wants to use them on our blog. Through this study, we've also got an understanding of uh, species richness across Australia. So where we have really amazing hotspots for frog species in Australia, like those areas in red in the North um, Queensland wet tropics, um, and also areas where we don't know if frogs exist at all. So for example, those white patches and um, the Nullarbor Plain being one of them. So really frog ID recordings are valuable in understanding where we can um, target our conservation efforts and where we have the most frog species. Another paper by Gracie was on habitat uh, modification and how um, frogs are responding in urban environments and, and altering their breeding. So um, what she found was that frogs are actually breeding earlier in our cities. And this is, whether this is a positive thing or a negative thing is uh, another study but they're breeding longer and they're breeding earlier in our cities. Um, and hopefully this doesn't mean bad news for their frogs, for their um, future frog populations. Another recent study was uh, looking at those green stream frogs. So about five different species and really showing that frog ID audio is super valuable in understanding distributions of frogs and actually informing frog conservation at rates higher than images would alone. So this is really great. It's showing that yes, frog ID audio recordings are very valuable in frog conservation um, and actually accruing data more rapidly than images would. And a study by another PhD student, Marie Thompson, looked at uh, what frogs use to uh, cue their breeding. So across Australia, we wouldn't be able to get this understanding without frog ID recordings. So what she did was look at different drivers, environmental drivers, such as day of year, rainfall and temperature. And surprisingly, the day of year was the most, uh, most strong driver that frogs use to cue their breeding. Usually it's temperature or rainfall, but uh, interestingly, day of year and um, average temperature for the last 10 days were, were the strongest drivers. So this information is really great for understanding um, how frogs are responding to climate change, for example, because with temperature increase, frogs might alter their breeding and they might um, shift this and this will have 
uh, a flow on effect to other animals in our ecosystem and the health of our ecosystem. Frog ID is also excitingly discovering new species. So that screaming tree frog um, we were talking about a bit earlier tonight was actually considered the bleating tree frog. So it was considered this one species which has recently been split into three different species. And we get the screaming tree frog down in our area. And this frog is, is really remarkable. It has such a piercing call. Um, but it was thanks to Frog ID recordings, actually thousands of audio files that looked at this species and could actually find out really subtle differences in their pitch and frequency. And we wouldn't normally have this information available to frog um, research. So it's thanks to people out there recording frog calls for science that is helping discover new frog species. Alarmingly, our team also started receiving uh, reports of sick and dead frogs across Australia last winter. Um, and this is just a screen grab of the con cons of a conversation article that our lead scientist, Dr. Jody Rowley, produced last year. Unfortunately, we're still getting reports of sick and dead frogs, and the green tree frog is one of the species that has been recorded reported sick um, and dead the most. And um, we do want you to keep an ear out for these, these species as well as others, but also if you see sick frogs, do let us know. So the next slide is going to have some sad images. So I just wanted to um, give you a bit of a warning that this might upset you um, before I move on. But if you do see a sick frog, they will look like this. They will have red darkened skin. Um, they will be lethargic and be out in the daytime uh, when they're normally mostly nocturnal. And so they'll just look really um, hunched over and, and just generally unwell. Um, and what our team thinks, um, well, they've actually done some testing on many frogs in New South Wales and as well as other parts of Australia. And disease is the number one suspect at the moment, but there are other things that may be at play here. So unfortunately, frogs are in more trouble than we thought. Um, and your help in reporting any of these sightings can really help us get to the bottom of this. So in summary, Frog ID is telling us a lot, thanks to Everyone out there recording frog calls in the rain, hail, in middle of winter, it's all making such a valuable contribution to frog research and conservation, and also biodiversity conservation in general. Um, if you'd like to find out more about our scientific outputs, do visit the Frog ID Science page. We have blogs on all of our scientific papers and they're all publicly available. Um, this is also where you can get uh, access to the Australian Frog Atlas if you'd like to look at those maps on Google Earth, for example. Um, I'm almost at the end of my presentation. I just want to go through some of the local frogs to your area and what they sound like uh, and um, what you can keep an ear out um, over the coming weeks and months. So... On the Frog ID page, you can look at our explore page and uh, enter your local government area. So this is a map of all the records in Frog ID records in Camden. Um, and we have over 160 Frog ID participants in, count in this council, which is wonderful. Um, we've recorded about 13 different frog species and almost uh, got a thousand scientific records of frogs, which is great. The most common species that we recorded on the Frog ID app in Camden Council is the common eastern froglet, which is our number one recorded species across Australia as well. But it sounds like a bit like a cricket. So these, uh, this frog species likes to call most times of the year and will tend to not be very fussy about where it breeds. So it's quite... Um, a common frog that we'll encounter. The next uh, recorded species, highest recorded species in Camden Council is a striped marsh frog, which kind of sounds like a wet tennis ball being hit or a dripping tap. So 
So they are another common species, a great frog to have around. Um, as I mentioned, they really love, um, they really thrive in human modified spaces. Uh, and so they may be a bit more tolerant to pollution and other things than our other frog species. Third on the list is the spotted marsh frog, which kind of sounds like uh, maybe like a machine gun. Another great frog species to have around and they will call during spring and summer. Next we have the screaming tree frog. Uh, hopefully this isn't too loud. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, you won't miss that one if you hear it. Hopefully it's not uh, living under your bedroom window and keeping you up at night. Um, but that frog species is uh, also breeding now and through uh, summer. Sorry. Uh, the next we have the Eastern Dwarf tree frog, which is one of our smallest tree frog species. And it sounds similar to a ratchet. So they'll be calling now. And what we'd love you to listen out for is our iconic green tree frog, Victoria cerulea. We hope they're doing okay in council. We've got a few records in your council and hopefully we can get some of them. So let me wrap up by um, mentioning a few things we can do to help our frogs around our homes. So as I mentioned, they're very sensitive to changes in the environment and pick up everything that's around them. So reducing our chemical use um, and pesticides um, and things like that really helps our frogs out. If you do need to use these chemicals, you can try to use them on um, days where no rain is forecast, so it doesn't uh, run off into um, healthy frog habitat. It's a good idea to also um, clean our boots, our footwear, and also our car tires when we enter frog habitat. So making sure all the muck is removed, but also that we can um, clean our boots off with the um, disinfectant and making sure that they're dry before we go into frog habitat. Keeping our pets indoors is really important as well, um, just to keep our frogs safe. And we can also support frogs by uh, creating frog habitat at home. So this is an example of a frog ID user who has created a frog pond with lots of uh, vegetation to help tadpoles hide from predators and also rocks and logs to help frogs um, leave the pond when they're ready. And so not all frog species can climb very well, so it's a good idea to support all different frog species by helping them uh, climb in and out of ponds readily. Another way you can help out is by participating in Frog ID Week, which is our annual frog count. So this is starting on Friday. And last year, we had the biggest Frog ID Week yet, where we recorded over 37,000 records of frogs. And hopefully we can meet that or maybe even beat it this year with your help. But this year, we've got a strong focus on increasing the spatial coverage of Frog ID. So not just in Frog ID Week, but whenever you're out traveling um, and camping or bushwalking, anywhere you are in Australia, please keep an ear out for frogs and record it, especially in those remote areas where we need more frog records from. And you can also help celebrate Frog ID by purchasing this unique album, which is a Songs of Disappearance album um, by the Bowbird Collective and Frog ID. So on this album, we feature all the threatened frog species in Australia. And it's, so it's a really a celebration of the unique frog species we have, but also a celebration of frog ID participants because many of those recordings were recorded by frog ID users. So last year they created this bird album. I don't know if you can see me on the screen, but they created this bird album last year and it helped raise funds for BirdLife Australia. And this year they're releasing uh, a frog version to help raise funds for Frog ID because we really need a lot of help to keep Frog ID going. So that's it from me. To summarize, please download the Frog ID app if you haven't already. Register a free account on our website and check out our new web features. 
Use the Near Me filter on the Frog ID app to understand the local frogs around you and get out to your local frog habitat and record frog calls as often as you can, especially during Frog ID Week this Friday.